Okay, um, thank you very much for, um, well, th I would like to start by thanking the organizers for putting up this uh, excellent conference and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to talk about some work I've been doing with uh, Rajesh Kopakuma over the last few years. And in particular, I want to speak about the paper that appeared about uh, a, a month ago. So let me start by trying to motivate uh, what we are trying to do. So one way to get a quantitative handle on the ADS-CFT correspondence is to consider the regime that's not normally considered. Normally one thinks about the correspondence in the regime where the gravity side is described by supergravity, which means corresponds to the fact that on the gauge theory side you had strong coupling, but you could ask what happens if you're on the gauge theory side you are at a weak coupling, so if the tooth parameter is small. So we take n large to decouple quantum gravity effects, we want to take g strings small so that we don't have to worry about uh, string loop amplitudes, and then we can ask what happens if we take the effective coupling constant at large n, which is the tooth parameter to be small, and if you, you, you use the usual translation into ADS parameters, then that means that the radius of the ADS space is small relative to the string length, or put differently, the string scale is much bigger than the typical radius of your space. So this means it's a very floppy string, it's, a, it's sort of the tensionless limit of string theory. So this is, this is an old idea, and in some sense this is what the, what the perturbative side of the gauge theory corresponds to. And now the question is, is this a useful regime? Can you do anything, can you describe it on the gravity side or not? And the idea is that there is again a redeeming feature in this limit, and the redeeming feature is that because it's a tensionless string, the stringy excitations become massless, and you end up with an infinite number of massless higher spin gauge fields, and because they're gauge fields, they constrain the theory again very tightly and give you a handle on describing this, uh, the gravitational regime, despite the fact that you are in the opposite regime to the supergravity regime. So it's the regime where the string is very large. And in some sense, this is the maximally unbroken phase of string theory, where you, all the symmetries that the theory sort of secretly has are, are, are visible, and the, uh, and, uh, and, and the normal string backgrounds are ones in which uh, some of these symmetries are broken. And, uh, and the big theme is to try to understand the ADS-CFT correspondence starting from this potentially perturbative duality relating a perturbative gauge theory to this uh, perturbative higher spin theory. So this has been taken as a, this idea is a, it has been around for a while and it has in the past mainly been taken as a general motivation to consider dualities between higher spin, Vasiliev higher spin theory. So Vasiliev pioneered the analysis of this uh, this theory is with, uh, with infinitely many massless uh, higher spin gauge fields to weakly coupled gauge theories. And uh, I'll, I'll review the status uh, of, of this game in a second. But I think uh, what's happened in the, in the last year or so, and, and, and Shiraz uh, mentioned this to a certain extent uh, this uh, morning in his overview talk, is that people are beginning to understand how this sits inside the really stringy ADS-CFT correspondence. And this is also what my talk will ultimately be about. This is uh, our recent progress in trying to make this happen in one dimension lower for ADS-3. So let me review basically where the where the... Uh, what these uh, dualities are like. So the first concrete proposal for such a duality was made by Klebanov and Polyakov in 2002, and he, they related a, a certain Vasiliev higher spin theory in ADS4 to the large n limit of a three-dimensional O-n vector model, and there are different versions, so there was sub subsequent work depending on whether you uh, take this, uh, so these are all vector-like theories, the central charge goes like n, not like n squared, this was also reviewed by Shiraz, and uh, these uh, fields, you can either take them to be bosons or fermions or the free or the interacting theory, and they correspond to the different variants of the Vasiliev theory in ADS4. And recently, there has been a generalization to switching on Chern Simons couplings on the gauge theory side, and that corresponds to looking at parity violating higher spin theories on ADS4. So it is a, a nice class of theories, and I think the, the Part of the, the main progress is due to the work of Guillaume Bien Yin, 2009-2010, who really made concrete checks of this duality and convinced many people that there is interesting structure there. They calculated three-point functions of the higher spin fields on ADS4 and compared them to three-point functions of the O-N vector model to leading order n 1 over n, and that I think gave very convincing evidence that these dualities are really uh, alive. And then recently there has been much progress. The symmetries have been understood more systematically, and now there is very good evidence for some of these. There are open questions, but I think there's very good evidence for this whole general idea. So, somewhat independently, together with uh, Rajesh, we proposed the lower dimensional version of this. Uh, so, the lower dimensional version involves the higher spin theory in ADS3. Now, ADS3 is, has a little bit more uh, flexibility. The, 
this is uh, you don't sweat, it's not quite parity violating, but you have a you have a, a, a parameter that characterizes the higher spin theory that determines the mass of the scalar field. The scalar field is not part of the higher spin multiplet, so you can add it separately. And we conjecture that this is due to the larger limit of a certain family of uh, WNK minimal models. So these are basically SUN level K cosets. And what you're instructed to do is to take the large NK limit while keeping the parameter N over N plus K fixed. And this is the parameter that's to be identified with the parameter characterizing the higher spin theory on ADS3. Now, I think it's also fair to say that uh, there's a fair number of evidence that has been found for this duality. And this has to do with the fact that three-dimensional higher spin theories are much simpler than the four-dimensional analogs. And also the two-dimensional conformal field theory is under very good control. So there is very much handle on both sides. And you can compare this in quite some detail. So in particular, the, the symmetries have been uh, compared and uh, checked to be the same. And this was really how this uh, whole subject started with the work of Henoen and Ray and Campoglioni et al., who analyzed the asymptotic symmetries of these higher spin theories and showed that there are WN, uh, WN symmetries. And then the quantum version of this was done together with uh, Rajesh about a year ago. And then uh, the spectrum has been uh, that has been matched, and then also the other checks that have been performed in one dimension higher have been checked. So the correlation functions have been compared on both sides, and there is non-trivial evidence that that works nicely. Now another aspect that has uh, been checked is uh, you people have looked at the black hole solutions of the ADS3 theories. Now black hole solutions are notoriously hard in these higher spin theories because the higher spin gauge symmetry is led to change the metric and it's very hard to know when you have found a black hole. But in three dimensions because of the Chan Simons description there's a way of characterizing gauge invariant information and there has been a proposal by Gutperle and Krauss and collaborators for what a black hole is and uh, their properties have been matched on the dual CFT side. So this is a, another nice uh, check of this correspondence. And then, as mentioned before, these are the SUN level K version, and then you can make it SON level K, and you can make it supersymmetric, and so on. So there are various generalizations that have been considered and are working equally nicely. Now today, what I want to talk about is uh, the uh, situation with large n equals to 4. So this is a, a specific uh, characterization of supersymmetry. I'm not claiming that n equals to 4 is a large number. It's a specific n equal to 4 super conformal field theory. But in order to explain to you how I, what sort of the idea behind this construction is, I have to review a little bit how one understands how the symmetries of the two descriptions are related. And because that's easiest in the bosonic case, let me briefly review how this worked in the bosonic case. So this is part of the reason why this is very doable, is that uh, uh, higher spin theories in ADS have a chain simons description. That's sort of familiar from the fact that pure gravity in ADS3 is be can be described as chain simons theory based on SL2R. And the idea of describing the higher spin theories is basically that you replace the SL2R by some infinite dimensional Lie algebra that's called HS lambda. You should really think of it as being SL lambda. It's the analytic continuation of SLN to non-integer N. It can be described quite concretely in terms of some universal enveloping algebra of SL2 divided by some quotient. And it gives rise to a Chan Simons theory that will describe spin fields of spin 2, 3, 4, and so on. Now, I'm not going to explain this to you in detail, but there's one feature you should know about this algebra, and that's what the basis looks like. So the basis will the basis of this algebra is parameterized in terms of generators that have uh, are labeled by two numbers. S is the spin, so S will run from 2, 3, 4 up to infinity, and N will run in modulus between, my, in modulus is less than S, so it will run from minus S plus 1 to S minus 1. So for example, if you take S equals to 2, then this will just be a minus 1, 0, and 1, and these are the three generators of SL2, and then correspondingly, these are the higher generators of the higher spin fields. So this is the Chan Simons theory that describes the higher spin theory in ADS3. So then you study the asymptotic symmetry. And what you do is you just follow the old prescription of Brown and Henault, and you study what the asymptotic symmetry is. And there's a basically a simple schematic way of understanding what happens. You see, what we are going to do is we are going to extend this algebra, if you wish, beyond the wedge. So if you recall what happens to pure gravity, for pure gravity you have SL2R, so that's L0, L plus minus 1. And when you go to the asymptotic symmetry, it becomes LN, where N runs over all integers, so it becomes 0, 0. And likewise, for these higher spin theories, they're initially generated by these generators VSN, where N is in modulus less than S. And as you go to the asymptotic symmetry, this constraint on N gets dropped, and you end up with some infinite dimensional W infinity algebra that's characterized by fields of spin 2 up to infinity, 
um, the way these W infinity algebras look like. And then what we've checked with Rajesh is that this algebra, the corresponding quantization of it, is really isomorphic to the quantum algebra that corresponds to these cosets. So now let's get back to what I really want to talk about today, namely the n equals to 4 version of this. So, so here the logic is the following. We want to really understand how these theories get connected to string theory. And therefore, we are going to sort of reverse the logic a bit. We are not going to start by constructing some higher spin CFT duality, but we are going to start with the string theory, and we are trying to find which higher spin theory could sort of be the, uh, the tensionless limit of it. So in order to make life simple, we should start with the most supersymmetric string theory. Everything I said so far was basically bosonic, but now let's uh, make life simple and start with something very supersymmetric. So what's the most supersymmetric string theory in this context? Well, that depends on your taste, but one point of view is that it's the string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1, because that will have uh, the large n equals to 4 superconformal symmetry for the dual CFT, as I'll review in a moment. And then the logic is that we're going to reverse engineer the higher spin theory that sort of connects to that. So let me first review a little bit uh, what's known about the dual CFT uh, corresponding to this background. You see, you can basically, you basically know what the answer is going to be, at least roughly. You see the ADS3 factor is going to give you a Virasoro algebra on the boundary, and then each S3 factor will give you an SU2 affine algebra on the boundary, and the S1 will give you a U1 algebra on the, on the boundary, and then you're going to have four supercharges. So you're going to get an algebra that's generated by four supercharges, two affine SU2 algebra, a Virasoro algebra, and affine U1 algebra. So that's what's called the large n equals to four superconformal algebra. Now, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but let me show it to you anyway. So this is, a, this is it's in, in almost its full glory. So I haven't written down the commutation relations of the uh, Virasoro generators with the rest, but uh, here they are. But let me talk you a little bit through it, because it um, looks maybe a little bit complicated. So we have the U1 currents. So this is just the U1 current algebra. So these are, it appears that there are four spots in this commutation relations. Then we have four free fermions. These are these Q generators, so these are the four free fermions, so A and B run over the four values. Then we have two copies of SU2. You see these are the affine SU2 commutation relations, and they have levels K plus and K minus. And you see that the fermions transform in a certain representation under these two SU2s. They sit in the 2, 2 under the two SU2s. Then we have the uh, uh, supercharges. So this is the supercharge anti-commutation relations. Again, they are labeled by a label that takes four values. And with respect to the SU2s, they again sit in a 2, 2. And then you see that the, uh, that the supercharges relate the, the, f the free boson, the U1, to the four fermions. Now what's remarkable about this algebra is that there is a free parameter. You see here there is a parameter gamma and 1 minus gamma appearing in the anti-commutation relations of the supercharges. So where does this come from? Well, one way of counting, think, of thinking about it is that this algebra is characterized by two parameters, namely the levels of the two affine SU2 algebra, K plus and K minus. And if you want to convert this into geometrical data, then one way of thinking about it is that, you, that, you, that the central charge can be calculated in terms of K plus and K minus. It's given as 6K plus K minus over K plus plus K minus. And th this parameter gamma, that appears in these anti-commutation relations is related to be a k minus over k plus plus k minus. So this is, if you, there's another parameterization in terms of alpha, this is basically the relative size of the two SU, SU3s. So, so what you have is the overall size, that's the central charge, and then you have the relative size of the two SU3s, which you can vary, but independent of how you choose them, you always have the n equals to 4, and you therefore have this large n equals to 4 superconformal symmetry that uh, is characterized by these two parameters, C and gamma. And what's important is that all the other structure constants are determined in terms of these two parameters. So there's, a, there's no other ambiguity anywhere in this algebra. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is what the dual of the string theory, the conformal field theory dual of the string theory will look like. So now we want to take this as an inspiration to try to construct some, some higher spin CFT duality that will at least contain this large n equals to 4 algebra. So the first question is what could be conceivably the, 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 the tooth limit side of the CFT. So we're looking for cosets that have this large n equals to 4. And there's basically only one, only one family of cosets known, and these are these n equal to four cosets uh, based on the Wolf symmetric spaces, and they are cosets uh, of SUN 
plus 2 level k over sun level k plus 2 together with uh, 4n plus 4 free fermions. So that's in the bosonic formulation and that's written in terms of n equals to 1 superconformal algebras. And they have been known to contain this large n equals to 4 algebra where the parameters k plus and k minus are specified in the terms of the labels appearing here as k plus 1 and n plus 1 respectively. And uh, remember this uh, gamma parameter k minus over k plus plus k minus is, e is therefore equal to n plus 1 over n plus k plus 2. And if you remember how the original coset looked like, that was the tooth parameter of the SUN level cosets in the bosonic construction. So you should, roughly speaking, think of this again as being the tooth parameter characterizing this gamma parameter of the large n equals to 4 algebra. Now, obviously, these cosets contain more than just the large n equals to 4 algebra. They contain many higher spin currents, but in particular, they contain the large n equals to 4 superconformal algebra. Now, as I said, we want to take this as an ansatz for the CFT dual of our higher spin theory. Now we want to reverse engineer the higher spin theory. So remember, originally we started from the higher spin theory and we calculated the asymptotic symmetry algebra. And what we said was the asymptotic symmetry algebra was extending the higher spin algebra beyond the wedge, relaxing the condition on N. Now we start on the other side. We have given the CFT symmetry and we want to reconstruct the higher spin symmetry from which by going to the asymptotic symmetry analysis, we are going to reconstruct it. So what this means is we have to restrict the algebra to the global part, to the wedge part. So what we are going to do is we are going to take these n equals to 4 cosets and we are going to calculate the, the wedge part of it and we are taking this as an ansatz for what the higher spin algebra should be, whose asymptotic symmetry algebra will reconstruct the algebra from which we started. So that's what I mean by reverse engineer. So remember the wedge modes are simply all the modes whose mode number is less than the conformal dimension. So let's look first at what survives when you do this to the n equals to, to the large n equals to 4 superconformal algebra. So here is again our large n equals to 4 superconformal algebra and remember we are now looking at the subalgebra where we strict to the mode numbers that are in modulus less than the conformal dimension. So the free fermions have h equals to a half, and we are thinking of doing this in the neuvish schwartz sector. So there is no half integer that's in modulus less than a half. So the four free fermions will simply disappear from this picture. The U1 current is a U1 current, so only the zero mode will survive. And if you look at the commutation relations, you see the zero mode is just central. The, the, the M term will disappear here. The Qs are not there, so the U1 will also disappear. So what you will be left over with are the zero modes of the two SU2s, the four supercharges, as well as the L0, L plus minus one generator of uh, SL of the of the real zero algebra and what you end up with is this algebra these are the surviving wedge generators l0 l plus minus one these four supercharges and the two su2s and they satisfy this algebra and this free parameter is still inherited because it comes from the anti-commutation relation of the supercharges now this algebra has a name it's an it's a, one of the exceptional super uh, Lie algebras because it's uh, the only I think the only finite dimensional super Lie algebra that has a free parameter I mean, it's rare. Normally, when you write on SU2, there is no free parameter. It's uh, the standard Lie algebras don't have any free parameter, but this is a super Lie algebra, and it has a free parameter despite the fact that it's finite dimensional. I mean, this is these are all the generators. So it's this a uh, very exceptional uh, uh, super Lie algebra D21 alpha, and therefore what we should now go ahead and do is find a higher spin theory that contains D21 alpha as its uh, as its global higher spin algebra. So, so that's what we have to do. We want to reverse engineer the higher spin theory that corresponds to this. So in particular, it must contain this exceptional super Lie algebra. And uh, there is a, fortunately, there's a very nice and natural way of constructing it. And this has to do that we start with the n equals to 2 version of the, higher, of the original higher spin proposal. Um, so this uh, it has a similar form to what I described before, except instead of SL2, you have OSP1 slash 2. So this is uh, marginally more complicated, but not uh, dramatically so. And there's still a parameter mu, just like before, and it characterizes the quotient by which you divide out. So that gives you the n equals to 2 higher spin algebra. And what uh, turned out to be the case was that if you tensor this, so this is an associative algebra, so you can tensor it with uh, matrix indices, so you tensor it with m by m interest, uh, matrices, you get a, another associative algebra and then you calculate the corresponding Lie algebra. And what you find is if you take the additional matrices to be two by two matrices, then, well, or any non-trivial number, then you will find that the resulting Lie algebra contains D21 alpha, where the gamma parameter that's uh, related to alpha in this manner is precisely equal to the mu parameter 
that appears in the construction of this n equals to 2 algebra. So this is a this is a, a nice way of it's not a totally obvious way of finding this large n equals to four the d to one alpha symmetry inside this higher spin construction but it's there, it's simply there. And what's nice about it is that the only thing you had to do to the n equals to two version was to tensor with Chan pattern indices. And you know that if you chan t just add in sort of Chan pattern in factors, you can basically repeat the whole construction of the higher spin theory. So you have guaranteed to have a good higher spin theory that will realize this. Uh, D to one alpha symmetry because you've uh, constructed it in terms of things you know by a small modification that corresponds to tensoring by a two by two matrix. And this is a, I mean, part of the motivation was the paper Giras reviewed, namely uh, making this, uh, this higher spin theory is non abelian. So here, we, when we make them non abelian, we make them more supersymmetric also in their case, and, and this worked very nicely. So now we have to work out what the, f so this is just the, the D to one alpha part of the higher spin. So now we have to ask what's the full higher spin content. So in order to do that, you have to understand what's the full spin content of this Lie algebra. And what you find, it contains eight spin fields for each spin greater than one, as well as seven fields of spin equal to one. And you can organize them obviously in representations of this uh, super Lie algebra. So it's D to one alpha plus a whole multiple of the D to one alpha uh, multiplets one for each spin. So it's in some sense the minimally, it's like a sort of like all of these Vasiliev theories, it's sort of the minimally spin coupled version of this algebra. But it's, uh, so this is as a representation of D to one alpha, but then the commutation relations again close and give you, make this into a Lie algebra or super Lie algebra. And now what's nice about it is that this is the, the higher spin content. You can look again at the asymptotic symmetry algebra and what you find is this matches precisely the symmetries of these n equals to four Wolf space cosets in the large nk limit, provided we take the tooth parameter to be equal to mu, just as we used to do in the original cases. And this, you see, is fixed by knowing how the large n equals to four algebra sits inside both cases, because there's a free parameter there, and you can calculate the free parameter on the higher spin side, and you can calculate it on the coset side. And in order to match it, that tells you that gamma, gamma was equal to mu on the higher spin side, and it was equal to this ratio on the coset side. So that tells you how you have to identify parameters. And this, therefore, gives a... a, a, a tells you how the, how the large NK coset models link up to its N, N equals to four higher spin theory. So this is just on the level of the, of the symmetries. So you can look a, li a little bit at the spectrum. So there are uh, BPS representations on the higher spin side. They are, correspond to complex scalars and Dirac fermions. They are of two varieties. And they correspond precisely to the chiral primaries of the coset CFTs together with their conjugates that are not going to explain to you precisely which chiral primaries there are, but there are a certain number of chiral primaries, and uh, the primitive ones are these that correspond to these scalars. And again, you can calculate the charges and masses on both sides, and it matches provided you make the identification that we've derived already uh, previously. So that's in some sense an independent check that uh, this is the correct uh, realization between these two descriptions. Now this, uh, this EFT also contains BPS representation that appear in, in multi-particle, in symmetrized or anti-symmetrized fusion products of these minimal reps, and they are, will appear with uh, quantum numbers that are characterized by these two SU2s. So you get one such BPS representation for each pair of L plus and L minus, where L plus and L minus are an arbitrary half integer. And again, they correspond to the multi-particle states of the higher spin scalar fields, and that's a consistent, a nice consistency check for this duality. We haven't quite checked it in full, blown, uh, I mean, we haven't applied, applied all the techniques we know how to apply, but it looks uh, on very uh, good grounds. I should also mention that it has, again, the light states problem, so this hasn't yet disappeared, but you wouldn't expect it to disappear at this stage. You should only disappear when you go to the stringy generalization. So now, given what Shiraz uh, said uh, earlier, so there's a, there's a natural idea you may have. You see, I told you that you have to take two by two matrices in order to get D21 alpha, but why should you stop at two by two matrices? Why not consider two M by two M matrices? And then you may think that if M stays small, it stays finite, it's much less than N, then you, are, then you are in the higher spin regime, whereas if M becomes large, you're in the stringy regime. So the idea is you should look at the non-abelium 2M uh, times 2M version of this higher spin theory and impose a UM singlet condition that describes the glue that will bind these uh, Vasiliev particles that transform in the adjoint representation of UM into uh, these strings. And th then you may believe that that may be dual to a suitable string theory. Now, in our case, we know which string theory it should be dual to because we started from the string theory. It should be string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1. 
So while we haven't quite established that, there's one nice consistency check that works out. And that has to do with looking at the BPS spectrum of this uh, higher spin theory. You see, the higher spin theory had multi-particle states corresponding to all of these representations. But once you, once you uh, make it non-abelian and impose the singlet condition, you, they become single particle states. So, you so the higher spin theory has single particle states that are associated to all of these representations, BPS single particle states, and they are precisely in one-to-one -one correspondence with the uh, supergravity spectrum of, of ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1, as was derived uh, many years ago by Jan de Boer and Kanderis et al. So that's a non-trivial check, and this is, a, this is in fact a, a little bit of a non-trivial check because uh, otherwise one doesn't know how to find anything that reproduces the supergravity spectrum. I should also say that it contains a double trace operator that will allow you to sort of switch on the tension. In fact, because the whole BPS spectrum matches also all the moduli match, and there is one that uh, will probably break the highest spin symmetry, but won't destroy the large n equals to four and it will move you away from this highly, super, highly symmetric higher spin point in the moduli space. Now, so what we've uh, managed to do is to find uh, this non-abelian higher spin theory that's uh, putatively dual to the to, to string theory. What we haven't quite managed to do is to find the CFT analog of making the higher spin theory non-abelian. But we hope that this may be a useful handle to finding that. And that would be interesting because that will fill a gap in the literature. Because you see that the CFT dual to string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1 is not known. There's a, there's a paper describing various attempts and why each of them fails. And what already fails on that level is that you can't reproduce the BPS spectrum of the supergravity in terms of the dual CFT. So our higher spin theory at least reproduces the BPS spectrum. So if you can translate this into a corresponding CFT construction, then that would give us a handle on finding the dual CFT to this uh, string theory. Now, we haven't quite managed to do this yet, but I'm still hopeful that uh, with, uh, with the right uh, point of view, uh, this will work. At least it gives you a new angle on how you should approach this problem. So uh, since my time is up, let me con conclude here. I've explained uh, what I think to be a, a, lar an, a large end for well, it's an interesting large n equals to 4 generalization of the bosonic minimal model holography. It relates a higher spin theory with n equals to 4 to a certain family of uh, coset CFTs. I think it's uh, because the higher spin theory seems to be un intimately connected to the string theory. It is the first step to trying to understand how this sits inside a full stringy correspondence. And I think this is a very concrete setting with lots of control on everything. So this is a, a very promising model to analyze. And uh, one of the things you may hope is that it will shed light on the dual CFT for string theory and this particular ADS background is. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comment or questions? The, there are two moduli in the string solution, ADS3 times S3 times S3 times S1. Can you identify them in the uh, higher spin description you proposed? Well, not, not uh, so we've identified the one which we believe to be, so, so the, the two you have in mind is, which is the other one you have in mind? Uh, it's just the, the, the axion and the, the size of S1, which is related to a string coupling. Yeah, so the, the size of the S1 is a little bit tricky because this is something I, there was a small comment on the, on the bottom of one of my slides. So you see, when you go to the wedge algebra, as I told you, the four fermions and the U1 decouple. So the, one is, the U1 has sort of disappeared from your higher spin description at that stage, and therefore you don't see it anymore. So once, once you reconstruct the full higher spin theory, you're somehow not quite seeing the U1. Now we believe we can somehow add in the U1, but that's a point we haven't quite understood. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so uh, he speaks a nice presentation. Okay, thank you for this.